Welcome to the SBI Podcast, offering CEOs, sales and marketing leaders ideas to make the number. Welcome SBI Podcast listeners and video podcast viewers. My name is Greg Alexander and I'm the CEO of SBI, a sales and marketing consulting firm dedicated to helping you make your number. This is the weekly SBI podcast, and its purpose is to help you make your number by getting your peers to share with you how they make theirs. Today's guest is Steve Rutledge, who is a Senior Vice President of Global Sales Operations and Enablement at the enterprise software company Genesis, who is the leader in the customer service business and contact center management software space. They have a little over 3,000 customers in 80 countries. Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks, Craig. Happy to be here. Okay, today we are going to ask Steve to help his peers set their companies up for success by discussing how to develop and execute a sales operations strategy. So how are we going to do this? We're going to use a section of SBI's revenue growth method to guide our conversation. Specifically, step five, sales strategy, phase 13, sales ops, which you can find on page 187 to 188. If you want to follow along at home and you still don't have a copy of this method, you can get it at salesbenchmarkindex.com forward slash 2016 hyphen report. All right, we're going to jump into it here. And Steve, I'm going to warm you up a little bit by asking some high level questions. And then in segment two and segment three, we'll get a little bit more specific. Um, so starting out, so for the audience, could you share what are the objectives of your sales ops team? Um, I, I think at this to maybe stay high level, I'll give you the uh, elevator pitch on probably the two objectives of our team. Um, number one is we need to let the company, and namely that's the head of sales, the CEO, the CFO, know what the outlook is for the business. And that might mean for the current quarter, it might mean for the next 12 months. So first and foremost, we have to give the number and the confidence behind how we're looking short-term, medium-term, and long-term in terms of the number. That's number one. And number two is for our sales teams and global sales organization, we need to give them the guidance and the tools that enable them to sell, to do it well, win a majority of the time, to do it, and to do it with as much ease as possible. Those are probably our two high-level objectives that I'll start out with. Okay, perfect. The reason why I asked that question is in order to develop a sales ops strategy, having objectives clearly understood up front by the sales ops team is a very important thing. So Steve just shared a couple, couple with us, and I think those are probably pretty consistent with other sales ops leaders. So let me, let me go to the next question, which is regarding internal processes that sales ops is responsible for. For example, order management, pricing, comp administration, et cetera. And the reason I ask this question, Steve, just to give you some, some con uh, context here, is sometimes we see sales ops kind of being a catch-all organization. You know, they do everything the organization needs to do that nobody else has time to do or wants to do. And that leads to a less productive sales ops group. So what are the internal processes that you own? Um, well, I guess I will say that what you're alluding to with sort of the catch-all, um, I can't say that we're free of that, but maybe we can talk about that a little bit later. Okay. In, in terms of the processes that we clearly own, um, we own um, doing the sales forecast. And I know in some organizations that's owned by finance, but really I'm kind of the right-hand person to our global head of sales for that process. And that includes what's being done in the sales regions and what rolls up to us every week. Um, we own the deal review process and approving, um, approving discounts and approving non-standard deals. We own win-loss analysis. We own doing RFPs, sales training. Um, we have an executive briefing center um, that we own. We have our reference database. We have social selling. We have our quote tool, quote to cash, um, defining our sales process. Um, so that's a that's a list of the very formal things that we own. I can't say it's all, but um, those are those are some of the key processes that we're responsible for. So that's a lot. So uh, you're very busy. Uh, you mentioned some things there, like the executive briefing center that. 
uh, we typically don't see um, in the responsibility of, of sales ops, but that's good context. It's good for the audience to understand the breadth and the depth of the things that you do. Um, you mentioned forecasting a few times and the key role that you and your team play in calling the number. What other key executive decisions do you help the executive team make? I think um, one of the, um, the things that has probably been most useful to our executive team is the output of our win-loss analysis, Greg. Um, we implemented this about seven quarters ago. One could argue we could have done it sooner, but um, we're on an evolution path here. And we, we made this systematic. We started capturing key data within Salesforce. Um, we, we created a, a system around uh, customer and partner interviews for both wins and losses. And it's that data about um, where we're winning and why and how can we perpetuate that behavior and where we're losing and why. Um, and what do we do about that? Are we chasing the wrong segment or do we have a non-competitive product? And so the output of that, whether good or bad, whether to continue or change our behavior, and those recommendations for the, the broader company, because often those things are, those reasons are outside of sales, um, that has probably been our, one of our key areas of, of, of influence and information going to the executive team. Um, certainly the, the forecast and the number, but I wouldn't say that that's necessarily these immediate executive decisions. Those are more updates. And that I, I would also say where we see growth potential, where we see increasing pipeline, where we see in a certain country or geo, all of a sudden, hey, um, our reps are doing really well. There's lots of pipeline and there's growth there and maybe lack of growth elsewhere. Probably that guidance on where we ought to be investing maybe a little more and a little less. Mm -hmm. But um, I would say in those order, in that order, um, probably with win loss being our, our major input to the executive team right now. Yeah, I'm really glad to hear that you're doing that, and I'm glad that it's a formal process. Um, you've been doing it for seven quarters now, and you're right. I mean, that information mm -hmm. could affect the product roadmap. It could affect the pricing strategy. It could affect the campaign process and marketing. Certainly can affect the things that the sales team does. But that information can be, um, should be placed in the center of the table for all of the uh, quarterly board meetings and monthly operating reviews, et cetera. So, yep. You're right. Absolutely right. Uh, yeah, that's great that you're doing that. All right, let me ask you my last question in, in this segment, and then we'll take a quick break here. So I was looking at your LinkedIn profile, and according to that, looks like you've been in the role now for about five years. So in your view, what are the major obstacles sales ops leaders need to overcome to be successful? Um, yes, and, and just for, for those listening, by the way, before this role, I had roles in product marketing and product management. This is, so this is, although five years is not where I spent my career, but I think leveraging that experience and wanting to be close to the sales team has made this an excellent job. And so if you're listening and you're in this role, I happen to think it's an important and growing role in companies, and I found, a, I found it to be a, a very exciting stage in my career. Anyway, back to your question, um, what are the obstacles? Um, you know, Greg, it really is, and you kind of alluded to it, it's the, it's the distractions. It's the all kinds of one-off requests or sort of never-ending tweaks or recommendations about what we could do. And a lot of them all by themselves can make pretty good sense. Like, okay, but I would say that we can do anything, but we can't do everything. And that's, that gets us into a challenge when you have, you know, a senior manager or a sales leader or influential rep who has a request and it's just really hard to get to everything. It, it, it really bogs, can bog us down. Yeah. And I would also say, you know, and I may not have the, the perfect words, but everybody has an opinion. <laughs> and I have 100 people, and I can get 100 opinions at least, or I can make a joke that I can get 101 opinions. But I will, you know, everybody has an opinion, and you can't live that way. You've got to say, you know, I, I have a strategy. It's informed. It's reviewed with the right people. I've got to focus on these things, and I've got to move forward. Yeah. If you don't do that, you'll never really get anywhere. You'll be busy. You can be busy all day with, you know, distractions and email. But you've got to say, what am I, what is informed, what do I feel confident about, and you've got to drive that. But we constantly have the distractions, and that, that's been, been our biggest obstacle so yeah. far, Greg. Yeah. So I agree, and, I, and I'm glad that you, you answered that way. And the reason, to be honest with you, the reason why I have you on the call today, the show today, is because you know, we deal with a lot of organizations that are underinvested in sales ops. I mean, it, 
if I just explain your background to people and you add it to it with product management, product marketing, but even just look at your academic credentials, I mean, Stanford and MIT. So for those sales leaders that are listening, ask yourself the question, I mean, do I really have a strategic thought partner in the role of sales ops? And if I don't, put one in there ASAP. And then when you put the person in there, make sure they can be successful by having a sales ops strategy that says, we're gonna do these things and we're not gonna do those things. And to Steve's point, sounds good. In practicality, maybe sometimes that doesn't happen, but having a direction versus no direction can cause the distractions to be fewer. There's always gonna be some, but it can reduce the number of distractions. Okay, we're gonna take a short break, and when we come back, Steve and I are gonna discuss analytics, data, and technology. Three big things in any sales ops strategy, so stick around after the break. You are watching SBI TV. This is a monthly web TV show featuring guests just like you, executives trying to grow their revenues. Each month, you can peek behind the scenes and watch your peers discuss their strategies for how they make their numbers. You are not going to want to miss this. Welcome back, my name is Greg Alexander and I'm the CEO of SBI. And my guest today is Steve Rutledge, who is the Senior Vice President of Sales Ops and Enablement at the enterprise software leader, Genesis. Today, we are discussing the development and execution of sales ops strategy. And we're using SBI's revenue growth methodology to do it. If you wanna follow along, that's pages 187 to 188. Okay, before the break, Steve shared with us how he established the objectives of the sales ops team. He explained to us which internal processes his team owns, and it was a long list. He informed us how he helps executives make key strategic decisions, particularly around using win-loss data. And lastly, he outlined what he feels to be the biggest obstacles to sales ops success based on him being in the role in the last five years, and these obstacles can be categorized as the never-ending distractions. Okay, during this segment, we're gonna hear from Steve about his approach to analytics, how he is leveraging data to derive insights into the business, and how he uses technology to increase the productivity of the sales force. So Steve, let me pull you back into the conversation here. As it relates to the topic of analytics, we see this continuum that has been popularized recently with the emergence of big data and predictive analytics applied to sales. And that continuum is, we start with descriptive, which describes what has happened in the past. We progress to diagnostic, which answers the question, why did that happen? And then we move to predictive, which says, if all things remain stable in the future, this is likely what's going to happen in the future. And our client base and our audience is somewhere along that continuum, all three being very hard to pull off, but worth the effort. Where are you and what have you learned? Well, Greg, I would love to tell you that we're predictive and world-class and run our business by large screen monitors all over our offices. <laughs> but uh, I think, unfortunately, most of our, most of our current status is, is in the diagnostic stage, and we probably have a toe in the water on the predictive. Um, we, we use uh, views of rep performance and um, pipeline and quota coverage and pipeline health, and we, we drill into that in terms of the, the source of leads and the type of accounts and do they f match back to our ICPs. And we're, we're, getting, we're getting pretty good there, at getting a good handle on the business and describing why things are moving or why they're not moving. But um, unfortunately, we're probably not at the predictive yet. Um, and, and I would extend my same thoughts to the win-loss analysis is that we do a pretty good view of what happened and, and why it happened, but um, we're not at the, um, the view of being able to, to, to really understand and guide the future just yet. Right. Well, you're being hard on yourself. You know, I, I remember at a time where you weren't in descriptive and you certainly weren't in diagnostic. So you guys have made quite a bit of progress and that should be inspiring for those listening and watching right now. And if you find yourself starting down the data journey, 
you know, Steve is somebody who's been on that journey and has accomplished a lot and is now progressing to predictive, which very few companies actually get to because level of dif difficulty is really hard. What makes it so hard is this concept of a data architecture. When, and a data architecture allows you to collect and most importantly, keep clean the data that you need to perform sales analytics, all three flavors of it, descriptive, diagnostic, and, and predictive. And taking a step back and thinking about the data architecture is uh, a big lift. And sometimes companies don't do it. And as a result of that, they're swimming in dirty data that they can do nothing with. So Steve, could you describe for the audience um, what your data architecture is? Um, yes, and the first thing I'll say is um, we have something now that we did not have five years ago, which is we have a really good IT team, a good leader and a good team beneath him, and they have been indispensable for us. Even if we buy cloud solutions, which we've had, we have for the most part, doesn't matter um, whether it's integrating them, leveraging them, keeping the data clean, um, or customizing it. The value of our IT team has been uh, has been great. So if you don't have a really good partner in IT, I would uh, recommend people lobby to get one because it will really help you. Um, we, in terms of keeping the data clean, we have had to take a a I'd say somewhat challenging, meaning that it's a lot of work and it's not glamorous, but an initiative we call MDM, um, Master Data Management, for both our account, customer, and prospect list, and also for our products. And we had, we've done a lot of acquisitions. We've grown organically and inorganically. So we've had a lot of accounts and different data sets thrown together. And so um, we, we, we couldn't live that way. So we, we had to create a, a master data architecture where we have a parent-child relationship and a single um, master or golden record of each account, and you can't create new accounts. And we've needed that to keep things clean. So again, not glamorous, but really valuable and important. Um, Second to that, I would say that our architecture, we've really, um, we really, we tried to think big and we really want to pull data from different systems in the company, including from our finance and accounting system and our HR system, not to mention our, our Salesforce system. And we've kind of tried to keep the end in mind, meaning what are we trying to do with this? We want to have certain outputs for sales managers, for company leaders, and we want to do some diagnostics. So I would say that our architecture is um, um, very much around some master data management. Um, we have a few systems that we rely upon, and we've really we, we've been very successful when we started with the end in mind and, and thought big about where we want to be to scale the business, even if it's hard to do. And those areas where we didn't quite think big or think about the end in mind, I think we've struggled a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that's that's really how we put it together, Greg. Yeah, so now I know why the partnership with IT in your case was so important, because you're pulling systems from finance, from HR, you know, systems that might not be within the sales and marketing stack and using that data as part of the feed into your master data management process. And, and uh, I couldn't agree with you more. It's critical, it's hard. It's hard to do that and there's no question. But taking a step back and embracing the concept of MDM can, uh, can pay huge dividends. Yeah, that takes me into the next section, which is, you know, what is your technology stack? So if we were to confine this to sales, you know, share with the audience a little bit about these different cloud services that you've embraced, you know, all of the technology tools that you're using to try to uh, enable this sales ops strategy. Okay, so our, um, we are a Salesforce shop. You know, we're, um, we're, we're around a billion dollar company, and so we've tried to scale and we've, um, we've leveraged the, um, the, the, uh, the breadth and scalability of Salesforce to do that, as well as the ecosystem. So it is, it is one of our foundational um, sort of uh, systems. Um, within Salesforce, um, we, we've added some tools and it is very nice to have tools that are natively or appear natively integrated to Salesforce. So we have invested in a company called Savo um, they're out of the Midwest, U.S., and uh, they have really helped us with our content management and having tools that are very field-friendly in terms of organizing and pushing content out to sales. Um, we have an LMS, a learning management system, that is also integrated into Salesforce, so we're very big on training and having it be required and testable and have managers see who's taken the training and who hasn't, so we've integrated that into to Salesforce 
We are a user of LinkedIn. We're a big believer in social selling and using uh, LinkedIn to uh, find people, to uh, understand folks more, and to really uh, um, supplement and augment the sales process. So we brought that in as well, as well as some other tools. So that's really kind of our productivity tools. On top of that, Greg, a, a big step for us has been investment in a tool called Burst. Um, there are other analytics tools out there, um, but Burst is the one that we've chosen along with our marketing team for sales and marketing analytics. And uh, we're getting going with that. There's a lot of potential there. Burst has the ability to pull in data not only from Salesforce, but also from NetSuite, from Workday, and other other applications that allow us to do a lot of very interesting things, like compare rep sales rep tenure to sales rep performance. You know, we don't want to replicate rep data that's in Workday um, and have our own separate database. We really just pull it in and say, hey, when did this rep start? And then how much time until their first deal? And um, are our reps who have been here five years or more more or less productive than our reps that have been here two years? We want to do analysis like that. So yeah. Burst allows us to tap into that data and, and make those comparisons, which, which we are finding useful. So I would say we're a Salesforce shop with some key add-ins, um, analytics layer on top, and then we pull in data from other systems like NetSuite and Workday to uh, really give us the insights that we're looking for. Okay. So things I heard, I heard CRM, I heard uh, mobile playbooks from Savo, I heard learning management. Um, obviously, I heard social selling from LinkedIn, uh, Burst for predictive analytics. Some things that I didn't hear, and I want to ask you about them just because I, I want to know if you chose not to implement them for a reason. Um, anything in the area of knowledge management? Um, we, we've done um, some knowledge management. Um, I guess we, we might use the term uh, content, and this is where we um, want to uh, push and make available, whether it's sales-oriented or even more technically oriented, uh, information out to our sales and sales engineers and our, you know, our solutions architects. Yep. Um, and then some of that we also um, use for uh, forums, meaning that there are lots of questions, there are lots of documents where sales reps need to talk to a product manager. And I know this is not in the training, and it's a very specific question. So we use the concept of forums to both post questions, but also, of course, store the answers and have those searchable. Yep. Um, so that's, that's, um, I'd say that's as far as we are on the, uh, the knowledge management continuum at this point. Okay. Anything in the area of incentive comp automation, configure price quote? Um, yes, we, we do do that. We're, um, we, we've recently made the decision, and I guess I'm kind of you know, talking about our, our systems here. We've recently made the decision to go to uh, Calidus. Okay. And um, we, we want to do a couple things with this. Um, one is we want to give, and we're, we're, we're bringing this up so it's not locked yet, so you're kind of catching this at a time where it's okay. a 2B state where we want to give reps real-time visibility uh, as well as what-if types of scenarios. You know, where am I year-to-date? What is my compensation? If I close this deal, which is made up of these types of products and services, where will I be against my, um, against my goal for the year? How much of my quota will it retire? Um, in addition, we want to be able to efficiently and, and quickly you know, process commission payments. Mm-hmm. And then I think the third part, and it's uh, maybe a cherry on the pie, is, and our CFO wants this, is they want to do um, commission expense forecasting. So based on what I think I'm going to do this quarter, what do I think my commission expense is going to be so I can do a, a, you know, a, a draft P&L? And that system will give us that as well. So that's um, something that's coming soon for us. Fantastic. You know, as you can see, audience, um, Steve has a very well thought out sales ops strategy and he has a very detailed technology stack that is allowing him to implement that strategy and be as data driven as he possibly could be. We're going to take a short break. uh, And when we return, we're going to focus on the difference between sales ops and sales enablement, which are two very different things, and how the two should work together. So come back after the break. Each day, you receive hundreds of emails, tons of text messages, countless telephone calls, and sit in too many meetings. How do you find ideas to make the number with all this noise? The SBI blog filters all this nonsense for you and presents only first-rate ideas to make the number. Simplify your life. Subscribe to one blog and read the best content. Go to salesbenchmarkindex.com and subscribe today.
Welcome back. My name is Greg Alexander, and I'm the CEO of SBI. And my guest today is Steve Rutledge, the SVP of Sales Ops and Enablement at Genesis. Today we are discussing how to develop and execute a sales ops strategy. During this segment, we're going to hear from Steve his views on the difference between sales ops and sales enablement and how the two should work together. So Steve, let's start with that softball, if you will. So in your opinion, what's the difference between sales ops and sales enablement? Well, I would say, Greg, that for better or worse, um, historically, internally at Genesis, we have not tried to distinguish. We, we've kind of put them together. Um, and and as I, as I talk to peers, I, I see that there are more distinctions. And we kind of, and you may, your caller, your listeners may sense that we're, we're we kind of combine them here, meaning that we look at some of the more hardcore quantitative things like forecasting and win-loss analysis, quote to cash. Those might be considered the more traditional sales operational type things, which, which our team does. Um, there might be a category sort of in the middle, which is these tools, which is like the, you know, the Savo and the LinkedIn and social selling and just getting them, getting them configured, deploying them, making them work, making them useful. Um, to me, that's kind of the, the bridge area. And then sales enablement, I would, I would say these are the things that um, sales really needs to be effective um, in the marketplace. You know, do they have the content that they need? Do they understand the offerings that we have? Um, do they have the training? Is it clear? Is it concise? Is it up to date? Is it persona-based? And so I guess we, we kind of we combine it all into one group here, for again, for better or worse. But yep. I would say that the difference is maybe the more quantitative tools versus the, the training and content and, and sales effectiveness. Okay. What I would add to that is a simple way to think about this is that sales ops is focused on making the sales team more efficient. And sales enablement is focused on making the sales team more effective. And combining effectiveness and efficiency, you know, is a one-two punch. The output of that is you have a company that's easy to sell for and a company that's easy to buy from. And it sounds very simple. Try not to confuse simple with easy. <laughs> that's hard to do. To make a company easy to sell for is hard. Make a company easy to buy from is hard. So I will tell you that this is the reason why we see organizations separating the two functions. And in some cases, we see sales ops rolling into the sales leader, and we see sales enablement rolling into the marketing leader, because it's an extension of product marketing in a lot of instances, or in some cases, an extension of the lead development team of the demand gen organization. So how do you feel about sales enablement reporting into marketing and sales ops reporting into sales. Do you think it matters? Would it change the outcome? What's your opinion on that? Um, I, I think the, the view that I have on this, and I, I like your distinction between the easy to sell for, easy to buy from, is we find it, um, we, we rely heavily upon marketing. Uh, marketing does our sales content and competitive analysis and positioning documents. So there's no doubt that we rely upon product marketing hugely. But the where we are right now, Greg, is is that the view that um, we look at the the concept of the conditions of satisfaction of the customer. And in our view, our you know our customer, we have external customers, but our, our customer that we're trying to uh, work for every day is our sales team members. And what are their conditions of satisfaction? Do they have what they need? Is it easy to find? Is it effective? Is it up to date? And um, I think by being in sales, I um, have almost by definition that advocacy of the sales team. And my, my goal is not to say this is done, check the box. My goal is to say, do we have, do our sales team members have what they need in their view, not somebody else's, but in their view, does it meet their conditions of satisfaction? And so because of that advocacy position, um, I have the opinion that um, sales operations, sales enablement, at least part of that role should belong in, in sales. You know, do we have what we need? Mm. Not someone saying, I gave that to you, therefore you have what you need. To me, there's a difference there right. and that um, it requires constant attention, even in the best of organizations, to make sure that we're being honest with ourselves. Yeah. However, we, we do 
regardless, rely upon our product marketing team hugely for the content. Um, perhaps in an organization where sales and marketing roll up to the same leader, and for us they do not, except maybe at the CFO level, or sorry, CEO level. Um, if, if they're combined in a single organization, then I can see that being a little bit different. But right now we have sales and marketing being different, doing different organizations. So for that reason, that advocacy is, is where I focus in. Interesting. You know, here's, here's what I would offer you. You know, if you think about the revenue growth supply chain, okay, literally links in the chain, you know, all the way to the left, you have corporate strategy, if you will, okay? And then that links into product strategy. And the job function that connects those two things is very often the strategy office. You'll see an EVP of strategy or an SVP of strategy. And that person is the interface into the product organization to make sure that the product roadmap is tight and targeted, that the R&D dollar is spent in markets that are going to grow against competitors that we can compete with effectively, et cetera. If you continue along and you now think about how the product link connects to the marketing link, this is where you see product management. That's the job that connects those two organizations. What does product management do? Product management tells engineering what to build, and they determine that by listening to the marketing organization and understanding the needs of customers, okay? So that's another job function that whose purpose in life is to connect two disparate organizations to each other, in that case, product and marketing. When you think about the link from marketing to sales, and you don't need me to tell you this, but this has been a link that has been broken for way too long. That connection point is usually sales enablement. Um, what we see is that when the connection point is product marketing, it's not connected. Product marketing is three parts marketing, one part sales. Where sales enablement is two parts marketing, two parts sales and it's a good connection point. And it serves to lubricate you know, cross-functional collaboration between marketing and sales, very similar to the way product management does it between product and marketing, and very similar to the way that the strategy office does it between the CEO and the CTO. Um, now, I, I'd be lying to the audience and lying to you, Steve, if I told you we see that all over the place, we don't. Where we do see that is um, in organizations that have very tight strategic alignment. And, and it's, which is a hard thing to accomplish, but when you get there, um, the benefit is great, particularly in, in your probability of making the number consistently and being a little bit more predictive. So something to keep an eye on. Um, first, I guess step one, if you guys decided to go in this direction, Steve, would be to separate sales ops and sales enablement. And then step two would be consider how to use sales enablement as a way to pull the marketing and sales teams together uh, more tightly. So that's my two cents on that concept. I think it's a very good suggestion. And for that easy to sell for and pulling the two together, I think um, you've given me some good thoughts here today. And I think that uh, there's some steps we can do to make those even tighter. So yeah. I agree. Cool. It's a critical link. All right. We're going to take one last break. When we come back, Steve and I will discuss what to do next if you are focused on developing and executing a sales ops strategy. So we call this the takeaway value, and it's just after the break. So stick in there for just a few more minutes. Do you have too many things to do and not enough time to do them? Is finding time to learn best practices almost impossible? The SBI podcast is your solution. Turn time spent exercising, commuting, and traveling into productive learning time with a subscription to the SBI Podcast. SBI Podcast listeners get unique insight into real-world sales and marketing issues through interviews with your industry peers every week. Find us on iTunes by searching for Sales Benchmark Index Podcast and subscribe today. Welcome back, everyone. Steve. I would like you to conclude our time together today with some practical advice. So let me ask you one final question that will allow you to summarize your thoughts. So here goes. If you were hired tomorrow by a company and you were tasked with developing and executing a sales ops strategy, what would you do first, second, and third? Okay, so you've given me the lovely... Uh 
hindsight and if we could do it all over again. Yeah, basically. <laughs> uh, we don't we love that. And maybe sometime in our lifetimes we'll <laughs> do this, but not yet. Um, I would say first, and ironically, Greg, you, you just touched on it, which is that alignment. It, it's kind of like if you don't get your act together up front, you may get out of the gate quickly, but you're, you're, the wheels are going to come off, and it's, it's going to be a lot harder than you think. And by that alignment, I mean with the company, the product, and the marketing strategy. Um, those need to dictate and inform and guide what you do with your sales organization from top to bottom. What's important that you report on? What do you train on? Where do you hire reps? Where do you maybe not hire reps this year? Um, I'm not saying that you sit and wait with your arms folded until someone hands this to you. Sales needs to be part of that because the sales organization knows what's going on in the market and they have lots to say. But they have to be locked arms, if, if you will, and part of that chain link to say, you know, what are our products that we think are winners in the market? Where do we really differentiate? Um, what is our message? Does it work? What are our ideal customer profiles? Are those really defined? Are we, are we making assumptions? Or are we actually defining them? Where are we placing bets? What regions with what products? And, um, and, and where, do we, uh, where do we think we'll have influence in the market? So I think if you get that aligned, then all of a sudden, all the feedback back to the marketing team about what kind of leads we're getting and what products we're pushing and where we're winning and losing, it starts to make really good sense. It's worth the effort up front to align as best you can, or even as sales to force that alignment. It's not like it's all going to be done for you when you walk in. So the more you can align and get clarity and work backwards, the better. Um, number two, I would say, is to get systematic. I'm telling you, if you take the time and you define a sales process, have this sales process in your CRM system, and you track your opportunities and your quotes, you track who takes training, you track your win-loss reasons. Um, we do a thing at Genesis where when we have a win, we do an automated announcement out to most of the company. Hey, we got a great win at such and such company. Sales reps love it. People know. Oh, that's people great. internally hear about it. Um, anyway, if you, if, you, if you take the time and get the stuff you need in the tools, then you can have your pipeline. You can judge movement. You can look at win rate and see how you're hitting your number. So much goodness comes out of that if you take the time to get systematic. Now, if you're a $12 million company, you're probably not there. You can probably use some spreadsheets, and you, you might have several, you know, only a handful of reps. But when you get to be 100, 200, 500 million, got to get systematic. It's going to help you understand what's going on. Your life's going to be easier. It's going to help you grow. I would say take the time to get systematic. Um, and so I would say do those first. My, my third point is I'm thinking here. I could have put this first, but I, I believe so strongly in aligning with the strategy and being systematic, I think it's still okay, which is to um, investigate best practices that are out there. I mean, we have a really – the sales enablement, sales enablement, um, sales ops uh, role in the industry has, has risen, in my view, to great prominence. We have lots of vendors that can give us lots of advice. We have lots of peer networking groups, lots of groups on LinkedIn – there's, it, it's an important role, and there's, a, there's good networks out there. And you don't have to invent the wheel yourself. You don't have to figure everything out yourself or start with a blank sheet of paper. A lot of things are being done out there that are interesting. A lot of, a lot of them you get from these podcasts. So I would say to um, don't reinvent the wheel. Reach out, whether it's talking to your you know, vendors or industry groups or networking events that happen, because there's lots that you can learn. Fantastic advice, really, isn't it? Uh, it's great to hear you articulate that and have it be so crystal clear in your mind. Okay, let me give you my two cents, audience members. So I'm going to give you some tough news. If you're like most companies, you think you have a sales ops strategy, and you simply don't. Most likely, sales ops is a dumping ground for all the things that need to get done that the field does not have time to do. What you really have is a series of tactics stitched together so you can respond to the field and the head of sales with their random request in some reasonable time period. Unfortunately, this causes companies to miss their number too often. And worse, it causes the people in sales ops jobs to have no life, working way too many hours and garnering little respect inside the organization. We call this role corruption and it's plaguing many companies 
and it has to stop today. Hopefully, Steve's example will motivate you to develop a proper sales ops strategy and take that sales ops strategy and socialize it with everybody inside the company, get the respect that you deserve and get your life back. Here are a couple of resources for you to do that. Get a copy of this year's report that we've published called How to Make Your Number in 2016, aptly titled, and you can get it at salesbenchmarkindex.com forward slash 2016 report. And this is what I use today to guide my conversation with Steve, and it's a step-by-step -step guide on how to get these things done. Also, you can have one of our experts lead you through a workshop, which will help you develop a sales ops strategy, and most importantly, convince your company that you need one. Sometimes, an independent objective third party can be very convincing. And by injecting that third party into the conversation, it looks like you might not be pushing your agenda. It might add credibility to the need for a sales ops strategy. It's the human nature, there's no way around it. If you want one of these experts to come see you, go back to the website, salesbenchmarkindex.com, and this time go forward slash 2016 workshop. Steve, you made a big contribution to our field here, and uh, you referenced the fact that the field has really developed over the last five years. And the reason why that's happened is because guys that are in the job, guys and gals that are in the job like you, do things like this and contribute back to the field. So I really wanted to pause for a moment and let you know how much I appreciate for your contribution that you made today. Oh, thanks for your comments, Greg, and uh, thanks for having me on. I've enjoyed doing this. Great. And a big thank you to our audience. You know, I appreciate the attention you give me every week. You're busy. And listening to podcasts and watching web video is probably not on the top of your list. But believe it or not, about 100,000 people are listening and watching to this show now. So I really thank you for squeezing me into your busy schedule. And I'll conclude as I always do, which is wishing you much success as you try and make your number. This has been the SBI Podcast. For more information on SBI services, case studies, the SBI team and how we work, or to subscribe to our other offerings, please visit us at salesbenchmarkindex.com.